Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Ricky, board member of KPMG Dubai and ex-CEO of KPMG India. Uh, I am chairing this session on how sustainable is the post-COVID economic reform. I would like to introduce my panel members uh, who are joining me in this important discussion. Uh, we have Peter Brimble, who is the private sector development advisor to DAI Global U United Kingdom. Peter has been working on business environment issues in Southeast Asia for many years. And since COVID-19, he has worked on various COVID-19 response activities in Myanmar and Cambodia. He's now working uh, on from a base office in England. Uh, we have with us uh, Nico Anton, who is the executive chairman of Connect uh, in the Netherlands, uh, leading uh, and financially independent network organization and trusted collaboration for Dutch industry, science and government with a strong international focus on smart and sustainable mobility and logistics. It is the potential of technology and the impact of climate change which are Nico's driving force, but working with people is what energizes him. Nico has more than two decades experience in general and change management and business strategy in smart mobility and logistics. We have another speaker who has not joined yet. Uh, he uh, hopefully will join us soon. It's Dwight Hopkins, founding director ESG Research Initiative Center at the University of Chicago, US. Dwight is passionate about accumulating resources to strengthen the common good, uh, especially investment funds with a global context. He enjoys finding new areas of resources, bridging networks and managing different types of people. Now that I've introduced the panel members, I'll just give a few opening remarks before I we get into the main session. So uh, what governments have been trying to do to reduce the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the economy, uh, major economic policy reforms have been introduced by different countries across the globe. Uh, as we have seen, uh, governments across Asia are pumping cash to households and businesses to help them survive the COVID crisis. At the moment, they don't seem concerned about sovereign debt repayment. So will the rise in future taxes be an acceptable outcome? So Asian countries, the support was aimed mainly to bring immediate support to corporates to prevent bankruptcies and defaults and limit instability risk in the financial sector. They also wanted to stimulate activity to encourage a rapid rebound by interest rate cuts, short term liquidity injection and uh, um, uh, short term liquidity to respond to demand support measures for SME sectors that were hit hardest. Uh, directly affected was retail trade and tourism, job support measures, stimulus packages, uh, stimulus packages, the varying degrees to which different economies have successfully achieved cross institutional cooperation between the central bank and federal governments will likely determine how both the uh, countries, uh, how different countries will emerge from the pandemic in the short term. Many feel that the past year and a half uh, to COVID Hardly anyone was spending money. Now the economy is opening up. People are spending and traveling. Uh, I'm not sure how well our systems are geared up to meet this high demand. So there is inflation which is being caused in the short term. Some cases it's quite high. Uh, secondly, the interest rates have been lowered to almost zero, which has spurred demand in households, which has also increased the inflation levels. Until recently, many economists believe that moderate inflation makes the economy perform better. However, a growing number of economists today believed that monetary authorities can best promote financial stability and economic growth by making a firm commitment to maintaining price stability. We have seen another cause of concern has been this entire geopolitical issues around which has created amount, a huge amount of supply chain disruptions, which itself has created supply chain constraints. Uh, the three factors that is pent up demand, uh, cash transfers, especially for households and services and supply chain disruptions will likely be transitionary and the impact should fade over time as the economies recover from the pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis caused significant deterioration in public finances. 
which call for a rethink of tax and spending policies once the recovery is well underway. It will be essential to create conditions for robust, resilient and inclusive economic growth, which in turn will support government finance in the future. We have seen examples in certain countries where a premature withdrawal of fiscal support and increased taxes uh, <clears throat> could risk the undermining the recovery as happened during the global financial crisis. Now, coming talking about India, it seems to be an exception as the direct support for COVID was not large as expected. Hence, the debt levels have been maintained. Still, India has gone through significant inflation, rise in commodity prices, especially energy, which is having a crippling impact on inflation besides other factors. On top of it, uh, the structural changes required post global financial crisis of 2008 had not been completed. And this is adding to the stress to the economy. It also appears that one of the largest economies, China, may have its growth, growth sputtering due to various reasons. This is not good for a healthy global economic growth. However, one cannot find fault with the government for supporting those who were in need during the COVID lockdown period. We now need to find out how we can have a soft landing of the accumulated debt with limited increase in either inflation or taxes. I would now like to go across to the to our uh, uh, esteemed panel and i would like to ask question so dwight first of all welcome uh, i had introduced you uh, uh, while you were not there uh, so, uh, so i'll ask the first question to you considering that today the world is so well connected anything happening in the us has an impact uh, us being the largest economy impacts the rest of the world can you kindly elaborate what is the economic and social impact in your country in view of the high inflation uh, which U.S. is experiencing today? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me for this panel. I always enjoy being part of the whole racist uh, process. And uh, again, this is one perspective from a U.S. location. Um, I think there's a hope and expectation that uh, inflation will abate in the U.S. I think that's a long-term perspective, but I think at the same time on the ground, what I mean on the ground, uh, people who are struggling every day from different sectors, different class backgrounds are struggling every day to deal with the increase in inflation. And it's very prominent and in, in right now, at least in my neck of the U.S., because we're just finishing Easter uh, about an hour ago. It's actually 2 a.m. in the morning Friday for me, so I stayed up. But we just finished family Easter, uh, Easter, excuse me, family Thanksgiving. Um, so there have been different surveys that talked about Americans' view toward inflation. Uh, there was a recent poll uh, two days ago that indicated that 77% of Americans say inflation has recently affected them and to some extent um, 61% say the same about say, said the same thing about the ongoing supply chain crisis. So you can see even from the data that inflation is a very important and a very pressing and a very disturbing reality, uh, if not for the long term, for the present time. Um, other indications, and a lot of these are from the official Labor Department at the United States federal level. Uh, they talked about the consumer price, price index had jumped 6.2% in October last month from a year earlier, from 2020. And as many of you already know, follow the news, that this is the largest year-over-year -year spike in more than 30 years, three decades. Um, we've known that uh, that prices are up since September, almost 6% year-on-year from last uh, September 2020. Um, and this is the fifth straight month, fifth straight month where inflation has surged more than five percent. And again, this is a uh, very, it's very disturbing. I don't know if you can come across the news. We have these data points, which I just indicated, both from official federal government level as well as independent, uh, both left to center and right to center. So it's pretty much consensus. Um, but even just today, or actually early this morning, when I went to the grocery store to get some things for Thanksgiving, the stores are packed, but there's a sense of unease and panic because there people are concerned about whether or no there are going to be shortages. And in fact, it's not even, but there, I've been to some stores here in Chicago and then there have been shelves, you know, that were empty. 
And so they're wondering about whether the you know, supply chain is going to be uh, rectified, whether inflation is going to go up more, so I should buy things now. At the same time, there's a lot of pent up demand since COVID. So that's being released in terms of consumer consumer purchases. And, you know, basically people want to try to live their own lives. Um, so I think all in all, uh, there's been some long term hope, but the immediate issue is very, very pressing. You probably also heard about in the last uh, six days that there have been these organized mass lootings throughout the United States. I won't go into all the details, but a lot of this is this is unprecedented in our country. And a lot of it's happening in the daytime. And usually it's in the urban areas or in one neighborhood. But now there are many of these lootings that's going on taking place in high end. I mean, literally one percent areas of America. So uh, there's optimism for the long term. But I think the question of uh, post COVID uh, uh, intensity of, of our anxiety of a lot of Americans not all, but a lot of Americans, is that the inflation is really, really bearing down hard on families. Richard, you are not uh, muted. You're unmuted. Okay, sorry. Sorry about Thanks, uh, Nico. Uh, uh, the inflation is quite acute in the Asian countries also. I was just speaking about the India inflation rates being very high, despite no, uh, not much stimulus given uh, to the citizens. Uh, so I think, I don't know, Europe, Nico, any thoughts about Europe on the inflation? Because this is an interesting point, because this is impacting, will impact taxes and others, because some way you have to deal with it, right? Yeah, well, I think the, the, the topic uh, Dwight is raising is uh, very interesting. You see the same in uh, in Europe. Uh, inflation is uh, very high. The uh, the policy of the European Central Bank is to keep uh, interest rates very low. Mm -hmm. So the moment as a household you have a certain amount of savings, you have yeah. to pay your bank for keeping the savings on your bank. So your yeah. uh, so your the prices are rising. If you have money, you have to pay for it. And then also in the Dutch tax system, uh, when you get your annual uh, tax uh, as a uh, citizen, the government uh, has an, uh, a 4% uh, fixed uh, tax on your savings. So in three ways, you are losing money right now. And I must say, uh, maybe unless... What Dwight was saying, uh, I don't see much unrest in the Netherlands yet regarding this topic. People are more concerned about a new uh, lockdown, which is uh, emerging. But uh, you can say on a more uh, subconscious level, there is a lot of unrest in society about the fact that people lost control of, of their lives. And um, so that is, I think, the bad side of what is happening uh, right now. There is... There is, I think, also a positive side. Um, when we were all forced uh, uh, last year in March to enter a lockdown, you noticed that within a few weeks, and the entire society changed to a digital way of communicating in business level, which I think was an astonishing uh, uh, accomplishment to, to reach this uh, very fast uh, change in uh, behavior. And we also saw that uh, there was quite a stress already on supply chains. Uh, a lot of people, yeah, they went to to the shops, do extra uh, shopping. But still, supply chains were able to get goods to the supermarkets and uh, shops. And you also noticed that the uh, e-commerce, which is already in the Netherlands a uh, well-established uh, business, was capable of uh, taking care of a huge demand. And a lot of people who never ordered via the internet now changed their behavior and also um, uh, yeah, went into this new world of e-commerce. So that looked good. But then you saw that the price of containers were rising sky high and still are sky high. You saw the disruption the uh, Forever Given uh, created in the Suez uh, Canal. And now you see here also a lot of stress on uh, supply chains. 
And we see logistics service providers who do not take in new customers because they don't have the capacity to, to deal with the uh, huge demand in the uh, supply chains. There are no empty shelves. That's the good news. But uh, it is a f- an, uh, quite a driver for the inflation, the, uh, the stress in the supply chains. Oh, you have to unmute again. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Nico, uh, uh, Nico, could you, do you think that this uh, COVID has fast forwarded this digitization? And do you see, uh, I mean, you did talk about digitization. You did talk about all of this. Do you think it's fast forwarded and how has it impacted human behavior? Because, you know, as humans, we were resisting some of this for a long time. I mean, it was there, but it was not happening. So can you enlighten the audience? Yeah, this? well, I, 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 can, I can speak roughly for what I see in the Netherlands yes. and what is yeah. happening around the uh, Netherlands. Uh, you see that you just have to go forward in a digitalization. Otherwise, uh, yeah, in a way, you're not connected to society anymore. I think there's a moral aspect behind this discussion because um, uh, what if people are too old or they are just alone and they can't cope with new, uh, yeah, with the access to the internet, then they have a uh, a tough uh, time. Uh, I think uh, what I also notice, I'm an employer myself. I uh, My foundation is a small foundation. I have a staff of 16 people. Uh, but I see that due to the pandemic, the travel time of my employers, they changed it into working time. So for me as an employer, I did not compl- I did not ask them so for them to do so. But you saw that the product- productivity has risen during the pandemic because uh, people just uh, were working uh, more, a lot at home, of course. Uh, but there's a downside again here, I think, that the um, the innovation is lacking behind now. So people like to be more at home. They see it as an advantage. They are closer to their kids. Uh, uh, so they feel uh, a better uh, balance to be more at home and not to have the travel time. But a lot of, uh, um, of my members are complaining about the fact that there's a lack of creativity because... For me, it is very difficult to have a meeting like this and do a creative session. For that, I like to have more interaction with people in a physical way to see, to look them really in the eyes and have an informal talk uh, whatsoever. So, yeah, there are pros and cons, uh, but behavior is changing. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Nico. Peter, let me come to you now. Uh, you have been uh, very closely involved with Myanmar and Cambodia. Uh, dealing with the COVID recovery and uh, you, you've done a lot of studies and work in this area. Uh, how do you see it there? And do you see inflation in the economy like we are seeing in other parts of the world? Thanks, um, Richard. Well, I, I just uh, browsing uh, through through the Financial Times and uh, there's a very interesting article on inflation and COVID. And it, it points out that uh, Asia as a group is facing considerably less inflation pressures than the rest of the world. Sure. Uh, and they point out explicitly that the reason for that, they say, is because the economies at a macro level handled the COVID crisis better than Europe and the United States, which is, sure. I think, a very interesting observation. So at least we can see the countries in Asia operating in, in a less stressful macro environment to address the challenges faced by COVID. Now, I can step down a little bit to a, a sort of like a country micro sure. approach, but I think some of the lessons learned are relevant. Um, in both Cambodia and in Myanmar, uh, they, they faced relatively fewer COVID health costs in the beginning. Uh, in fact, most of mainland Southeast Asia did not really face the kind of challenges uh, that, that, that um, Europe and, and, and the U.S. faced. Um, and but they did face external challenges, demand, supply chain issues, as as other partners have mentioned, and both of them sort of took advantage of 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 the situation to focus their broader macroeconomic reforms. Both countries 
pretty underdeveloped. Both countries struggling to develop business sectors to put in place a business environment conducive to growth and so on and so forth. Um, um, and I think the COVID crisis, both because it had direct macro impacts, but also because it affected uh, already existing challenges of inequality, of poverty, of uh, people in disadvantaged areas. It, it really did provide an opportunity for the governments to come together and pull together um, relatively comprehensive and prompt response plans that focused on a range of issues. In Cambodia, for example, the key focus was on one digital sector development. Before COVID, it had been it would never be the number one issue on a on a broad macroeconomic framework. And some of the background research they've done since COVID has been very, very good and, and very strong. Whether they can implement it, another question. Second is on um, MSMEs. Uh, trying to address the obvious challenges faced by small and medium enterprises in the economy, especially those not formally registered, not formally in the um, uh, in the economic social safety net. Um, next is skills development. Next is green economy. So it's it's even had an impact to move green economy and climate issues up the agenda. And and lastly, social pro strengthening social protection that both countries had tremendous weaknesses in their social protection system. This applies to Thailand, Vietnam, um, other countries in Southeast Asia as well. And some of the um, the non-continental countries like Philippines and Indonesia actually facing much stronger health challenges. But uh, so I think the, I think they, by by using the COVID story to, pull together what may have been a less coherent set of reforms and trying to lay the foundations for some kind of future development post-COVID, um, using the COVID pressures. And all the countries face more significant health challenges going into the second and third wave. So, you know, they face the challenges of shutdown. Cambodia has just completed a pretty comprehensive vaccine program maybe one of the more comprehensive in the world. Um, and as a result of that, have now kind of opened up the economy again for foreign investors and other people to come in. So uh, the health, clearly the, the way that you handle the health implications of COVID are critical. Um, now, I would just say, as of February this year, the two countries I'm looking at diverge. Uh, Cambodia moved into a very strong uh, early this year, vaccine program, as I said, trying to build back um, businesses and so on, and they are moving quite well on this COVID recovery strategy. Myanmar, on the other hand, had a military coup uh, in February, and that has led to a kind of, uh, uh, how can I say it, a, a much bigger complicated situation in Myanmar, uh, very complex in both handling the economic outcomes of the coup itself and the way the military have handled the economy and the fact that the economy was already very weak in the health sector and not well geared up to cope with the, I guess it was the third or the second or third wave of COVID. And now, both on the economic side and the health side, things in Myanmar have really uh, taken a turn for the worse. And I think it's a, a real struggle for everybody there. But even there, the COVID response plan did have some potential and was a relatively, a relatively sensible program. So I think they're coping very differently, one well, one not well at all. But some of the lessons learned uh, to, to move priorities into digital issues, into social safety nets, have, I think, been very instructive. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think that was very interesting. You're saying Asia is generally handled. Inflation seems to be under control. India may be an exception because of, like I said, the energy prices going through the roof uh, and Europe and America going through its own challenges. Uh, Nico, I'd like to come to you now with this whole, you, you did touch on this work from home kind of model or this new hybrid work model that is emerging, whether it's work from home, anywhere, office, has become the order of the day. We don't know where this model is going to settle, honestly. But uh, uh, companies are experimenting differently. How do you see this, in your view, playing out in the long run? 
Well, I think in the in the long run, um, to my expectation, uh, the hybrid way of working will become more dominant. Yeah. Uh, but still, uh, a lot of companies have to develop a new approach. Uh, do we expect that people work only at certain days in a week at home? Or uh, is it more that you can work flexible? So maybe you're almost every day at, uh, at your office, but not the entire day. So you don't have to uh, deal with the uh, usual traffic jams, but that you travel outside the traffic jam. Everybody is saying, well, this would be a huge benefit of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic when we have a more hybrid way of working. Uh, you can uh, now see, uh, I can make a few observations about this. Uh, first, you see that some employers are saying, um, on one hand, productivity is rising because I see part of my staff even working harder at home because they really like the trust they get to organize their work and uh, but also take care of other issues when they're at home because maybe when the plumber has to come, uh, you don't have to take a day off. You just can take care of it. Uh, but on the other hand, you also see part of the team I cannot trust because they, uh, well, they make, uh, they organize their way their day in a way that they benefit of the advantages, but do not deliver a whole. So that are challenges an employer has to deal with. This has also to deal with a trust issue in an, in an organization. It is not something I, which is in my concern, so I don't have this issue in my own uh, foundation, but I know of members of me who are uh, dealing with these uh, issues. The other thing is that despite the advantage everybody sees of hybrid working, that habits are very difficult to change. Because when uh, the Dutch government decided in summer to reopen the entire society, immediately all the traffic jams were back, which was astonishing because everybody was saying, well, a huge advantage of the whole pandemic was that we don't have to, uh, that there are no traffic jams anymore. So we can invest less in infrastructure uh, because if you can uh, spread the entire traffic over the day, uh, we can better use the existing infrastructure. And it saves a lot of money in building new infrastructure. And the main concern in the Netherlands at the moment is that uh, the maintenance of the infrastructure is costing an, a lot of money. Most of our infrastructure was built in the 60s. And so it is really, uh, they really need to, a lot of maintenance is needed. So everybody is well seeing the advantages, but then behavior seems to be very difficult to change. So uh, apparently everybody jumped into the car or in public transport at the same time again, and we had the traffic jams uh, back. So despite the fact that you see on a general level, the advantages, both as a society and as an employer, apparently to change behavior on an individual level is a difficult issue. People tend to say, okay, let the other people change instead of that I will change. So that is uh, so, but I think uh, to answer your question, uh, Richard, that on the long run, we do will have a shift in the way how we uh, deal with uh, uh, commu commuting uh, and so on, uh, but we're not there yet. Yeah, <clears throat> I think this is going to be a big challenge and I agree with you, you know, uh, when COVID came in and there was lockdown, suddenly the environment looked so much cleaner using traffic jams. Yes, I agree. But even the environment looked cleaner and suddenly it was all back once it opened up. Yeah. So habits, behavior, thank you. Those are two good points. Uh, Peter, can I come to you now? Uh, what is the role of digitization and fintech in turning around economies to bring back growth? How are you seeing it? And how is the finance and payment system disrupting and probably bringing in more efficiency in the system? Yeah, great. I think uh, one, one small addition to, to what Nico mentioned. I must yes. say, in I find having just moved back to England um, that the discussions about um, the work, the the way of working, and whether you work home or whether you go to the office, and so on. In England, it's a bit like the weather. Everybody talks about that. Um, in Southeast Asia, I must say, uh, 
the issue the, the issues that seem to be talked about more are are small and medium enterprises ready to adopt digital technologies are are companies taking steps and the actual working modality although many people are working at home and so on uh, don't seem to have the same amount of attention so i i must say it's it's interesting i find the same thing in england that people talk a lot about that and me i'm working at home now i frankly i miss going into the office i miss looking at somebody in the eyes and and i think the whole issue of productivity as you said or innovation may be better but i think in 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 um in asia and, and certainly in myanmar in, in cambodia and the countries around there um there's no question that the impact of covid on the approach towards digitalization the willingness to consider risks um the way in which it's affecting policy making is quite is quite um significant um in in both myanmar and cambodia where i've worked uh covid resulted in some very str- very detailed and and analytical considerations of how digitalization can help make um small enterprises more effective can improve policy making um the whole issue of the payments system qr codes the introduction of qr codes it had been talked about but not not really focused on and i think um for msmes uh the um the impact of the covid crisis on financial technology firms on fintech on firms offering um digital type solution delivery companies and so on uh the, these have really been beneficiaries across the board and i think um in particular for companies that can work with small and medium enterprises to improve their access to finance to stimulate greater efficiency has been a tremendous uh i think a really positive development in 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 the last couple of years um i think it's also making policy makers become more i don't know how changing their attitudes as well we have a discussion right now going on in cambodia with two different agencies and one of the agencies is still taking a very traditional approach to digitalization trying to consider very carefully all the risks study everything 10 times before doing anything the other agency which is quite innovative i think is uh, is saying things like we need to introduce a fintech sandbox to allow fintechs to experiment in key areas crowdfunding uh, whatever and we need to take the risk <laughs> we need to be aware of the risk but we need to take the risk and i think that change in mindset has been something that has been stimulated and and pushed ahead by covid in a in a real way even in myanmar where the the military regime has restricted internet access as has led to all kinds of of issues of supply chains and logistics and what not even there we put in place some work um a project particularly called the Myanmar Microfinance Digitization Project which basically is a kind of indirect real time retail payment approach setting up systems to link microfinance institutions um it's actually going ahead it doesn't need government approval to go ahead um and it doesn't need fantastic internet access to go ahead but it is proceeding and 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 basically shifting the need for MSMEs to deal in cash um and and so i think there is some macro macro attitude changes and some micro developments that that show how uh digitalization can really have a strong impact on the economy on value chains on small enterprises yeah. thank you um, yeah thanks peter i think this uh digitization and fintech companies are actually going to change the way world is and we have seen it across the spectrum uh, and thanks for those insights uh, dwight can i come to you now wealth creation is one of the subjects you teach uh, is there any change in the way we understand wealth creation in the pre covid and we are still in the post covid but we are still in that recovery phase and or does it remain the same and would you like to share some insights around this with us uh yes yes i think it's a great question um um let me before i deal with the wealth wealth question i would like to go back to sort of the the pandemic 
and the prospects for recovery and how governmental policies impact sure. the U.S. Um, it's probably, as many of you know, in the U.S., it's a pretty uh, polarized situation right now. Um, and so a lot of the implementation and even the interpretation of what is science and data are all impacted by one's political views. Um, and so that impacts uh, the effort to pull together a national or federal single policy that would impact all 50 states. So then so I think we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a slice of history or part of a process in the U.S. where the intense polarization color, cover, colors everything. So that's one thing I think that's uh, depending on one's political view, either enhancing the recovery on, uh, with COVID and the pandemic or just facilitating it to linger even longer. A second uh, issue that's uh, impacting how the recovery can take place as far as, you know, who's being what, who's being locked down, quarantine, who's not, um, is just a deep part of American culture, which resists any interference or presence of government in one's individual decision making. So um, it'd be hard to say that there's one policy or one layer or one representation of, you know, uh, U.S. recovery or efforts to recovery from the pandemic because of those. Just an example for uh, there have been states that didn't shut down and they're saying that, well, we ne- we didn't shut down. And look, we, we don't have a, you know, a whole uh, huge examples of COVID. And you have others that shut down and say, well, we we didn't either. So, you know, which which data point do we use? Um, great example is my son. I live, I live in Chicago, which is in the state of uh, Illinois. And Illinois is connected to another state, Indiana. And so we live in Chicago. And then my son takes ice skating in Indiana. Well, Indiana never used, they didn't use masks. They never used masks. So we crossed the state line for his, his, uh, you know, his weekly skating lessons. Nobody there, restaurants, gas stations, petrol stations, ice skating, colleges. They just, it's an amazing. So obviously Indiana, they said, well, look, look, we don't have, from their perspective, we don't have a lot of COVID outbreaks. And you guys and gals just across the board in Illinois, you've been shut down and wearing masks all this time. And you have more than we have. So it's a really complicated and layered uh, perspective on the recovery in the U.S. Um, in terms of the wealth gap thing, I think one of the biggest uh, factors, uh, one one of the biggest indications of, of wealth uh, post-COVID is the redistribution or further consolidation of wealth among the 1%. Um, for example, Amer- America's billionaires <clears throat> grew to $2.1 trillion dollars richer during the pandemic. So that's a huge amount of money and that took place during during the pandemic. Um, and also not only did their the increase of wealth and ownership uh, increase on in the billionaire class, but the number of billionaires also increased as well. So um, during pre-COVID there were well it's about a six hundred six hundred six hundred fifteen I think the number is of Americans who had 10 figure bank accounts and today there's almost 800. So um, it increased at a huge, huge rate. Uh, and, um, you know, we, a lot of these things you may have run across in your own research, but 10% of the richest people in the United States uh, now own almost 70% of the country's total wealth. And the bottom 50% of U.S. citizens only hold 2% of all U.S. wealth. And so, you know, the, the pandemic has definitely impacted the, the notion of wealth, you know, what it is, and it's impacted the numbers and redistribution up towards the numbers who are mainly accumulating wealth. Um, this is uh, obviously been a, a, a concern. And again, the concern about wealth in the United States is partially uh, vetted or through the lens, if you will, of which political you know, cable news station, which political newspapers, which political parties are interpreting wealth. Um, but I, I think the data pretty much shows that the wealth issue has been, um, you know, been beneficial, if that's your perspective, or exacerbated, if that's your perspective, with a more and more redistribution of wealth upward. And so this obviously has um, you know, social implications about how people are gonna, going to make it, right? Um, there's this whole nation, notion the United States uh, imagination or culture or expectation that the children of the parents will do much better than uh, the children. The children of the parents, the children will do much better 
than the parents did in their generation. And that's the issue that uh, outside the one percent, that's obviously being a question that's coming coming to play, whether or not that, that that cultural memory or that history or that mythology of America is going to hold. And so you have that as well. What's the social implications of this wealth? At the same time, it's interesting because you, if there's a huge wealth redistribution more and more up, but at the same time, I think there's this pent up demand and savings and desire to spend that a lot of Americans had during the pandemic. And now that uh, pretty much all the states there, if not all are totally open, most are open. People are spending madly. You know, there were over uh, almost 47.5 million travelers during this Thanksgiving week, which has probably been the largest in maybe, you know, 15 years. So people are, you know, they're go- they're there go- they're some politicians says don't go home. If you go home, you use masks over dinner. Nobody's going to adhere to that. So this, hopefully this consumer uh, demand, consumer expenses will push the economy forward in a positive way. And, um, you know, the question of wealth is one question. The question of income is another. And the question of how different layers of society, different layers of Americans and the American society are responding to this wealth is another question. But it's 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 a major issue. Um, I think just in terms of perception of wealth and the popular perception in the U.S., a lot of people don't make a distinction between wealth and income. And a lot of people are just, you know, trying to get their kids to school, trying to, you know, deal with what the what the new normal will be post with post COVID. Of course, that has implications depending on what state you're in and which are who's your governor. Um, so the wealth is reality and the data speak to a reality. But also there's a perception of people who may not one make a distinction between wealth and income and two are so focused on what's in front of them that the issue of wealth uh, may not be a, a major uh, major you know concern on their radar. <clears throat> Thank you, Dwight. I think this uh, wealth creation amongst the rich is, I think, a global phenomenon. And the rich have gone richer. And uh, so I think the gap is widened. And I think we need to see how we bring back inclusive growth. Uh, we just got a few minutes left. Uh, Nico, can I come to you? Because uh, I think possibly this could be the last question I have because we just got three, four minutes. Uh, there is a positive uplift in the economies across the globe. And the countries seem to be coming back to normalcy, other than the lockdown in Netherlands, which may be announced tonight. Uh, but is it time to make supply chains more resilient than what they were? Because the one thing that got broken was the supply chain, actually. Yeah, well, you see that the stress created uh, in supply chains created also strategic uh, issues. Um, I think the European Union as a whole is strong on economics. Uh, also on, uh, let's say, uh, laws regarding uh, data pr- privacy, but it is not a very strategic approach. So we, the the European Union as a whole, uh, made uh, became aware of the fact that they depend on very long supply chains from Asia or uh, other parts of the world which they do not control. And you saw a very normal uh, situation that a lot of our medicine are coming from China or India. Yes. That both countries saying, well, we are going to produce medicine for our own people first, which Mm -hmm. seems very natural approach. So one discussion you have now is uh, how can you change uh, supply chains that you still make use of the entire world? But in case if there's a disruption that you can change. So, for example, we have now an experiment with a large brewery in the Netherlands. Now, a brewery produces alcohol, of course, to uh, in the end to uh, to sell the beer. But the government is now giving them uh, uh, plastic bottles and uh, also glycerin. So that in case there is a disruption of uh, sanitizing products, they can uh, make use of the alcohol they produce together with the bottles and the glycerin to produce uh, sanitizing gels for the, uh, which you can then distribute in the Netherlands itself. So you only have to pay some storage facilities to take care of a disruption. Well, this is a way of how now in several businesses, there's a rethinking about what is the strategic design behind supply chains. Uh, I don't think the 
answer is that we uh, that everybody tries to produce everything for their own. I think there's a benefit uh, if we uh, if we make use of the uh, well, let's say all the facilities the world as a whole as a whole can uh, can offer. But apart from this strategic approach, you also saw a very important other uh, topic. Um, uh, namely the sustainability. All the very long worldwide supply chains uh, are, not very, are not very sustainable. So there are two drivers now. The strategic driver, how to become, how to uh, tackle a disruption. And the second one, how to make the supply chains more sustainable. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, and I think uh, I just got a notification that uh, session time is over. And uh, I would like to thank all the panel members for your insights, uh, valuable insights that you have given. And uh, I think ESG, uh, and just to end, Nico, which you said is sustainable and ESG is becoming a big hot topic today. And I think world over, everybody is looking at carefully. Uh, with that, I would like to wish each of you all the best and stay safe. Uh, as we deal with the further pandemic, as it continues, it's not gone away, actually. Okay, bye. And thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. And and thank you, Richard, you. for hosting thank us. You. Good to you, meet everybody. And bye, thank you for, two, for being here at 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. your time <laughs> or whatever, or 2.30 now. 2.30, <laughs> so, but that's okay. 2.30. <laughs> yeah. Now, please go and have a good sleep. Okay, okay. bye. Be well. Bye. Thank bye. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.